enough to say that you could ID a developer, but if you combine them all together, you get a fingerprint that's very unique to that developer's development environment. And by that, I mean the machine he's building it on and also the source code that he's using. For developer fingerprinting, these are the different classes I break it out into. That's just to help keep things organized. I'll treat the communications as a separate problem from the survival of reboot because typically those are separate functions and they're thought of as different projects, little sub-projects in the malware in terms of what the developer's doing. Or he may cut and paste one of the capabilities, but he hand-coded the other one. So now the cut and pasted will have a lot of commonalities with things that also cut and paste that, but the other one, that's something unique to the developer and would have a stronger fingerprint associated with it. Now toolkits, uh, Poison Ivy comes to mind. Uh, these are toolkits uh, that can build a malware program for people who don't have the coding skills or they don't have the time to write the code themselves. Uh, these are actually strongly fingerprintable. It should be pretty easy to understand that when you have a toolkit that produces a malware, all the things that are produced tend to look alike. So it's easy to say, oh, this is a poison ivy variant or, you know, this is a you know, fill in the blank, whatever, or a rat access tool they're using. So in that case, look at this diagram. We have the toolkit. Then we have the different malware authors that are all using the same toolkit. We have different binaries, but the parts of the toolkit that are expressed uh, are expressed in physical memory and you can extract them. So to start this off, I'm gonna look at paths. I pick paths because they're so easy to understand. So it's a nice entry level to this whole idea. Now, I almost didn't wanna give this talk because these things are so easy to work with once you know what you're doing and you're kind of thinking about it. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be just as easy for a bad guy to remove them if he wanted to. It just so happens that they're just not doing that right now. Um, so this is kind of a double-edged sword, but uh, I still I wanted to give the talk and I wanted to you know get you started on this. So uh, let's let's look at a, a ghost rat. Ghost rat is sort of famous because last year it came out that the Chinese government was using ghost rat to spy on political dissidents, and um, there's even a Wikipedia page about it that it's penetrated some of the most sensitive networks on Earth and that it's in 103 countries and that it focuses on high-value political and economic targets. That's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty interesting description. It makes it sound really scary. So I, have a, I actually have several different GhostNet um, droppers in my possession that I've analyzed. I, I took one. This one was UPX packed, which is actually pretty, um, not very elite really, but it worked to get around the um, signature-based detection which actually is an interesting problem. You think something so simple as UPX actually works really well. Embedded down halfway inside is this other MZ header. So what that tells you when you see something like that is that there's another secondary binary embedded in the first one. Uh, again, this isn't very hard to do. You can see it right in the binary. And you can actually see this program cannot be run in DOS mode. UPX actually was supposed to have uh, sort of pseudo encrypted this, but you can see it didn't do a very good job on the string. So you can actually read it that it's there. Now this thing will get dropped out when the dropper executes and you'll have a second binary to, to work with. Right in front of that embedded resource is something called a resource culture code. That resource culture code in this binary is set to Chinese simplified PRC. That would only be set if the developer set it specifically and on purpose, or he's using a Chinese version of Dev Studio. And it's probably the latter. So this is a very good indicator that not necessarily that it came from China, but that the developer of the system was in fact, uh, spoke Chinese and worked probably his primary language. So the secondary pops out and it's not packed, which is great. And right out of the thing, we can see what's called a PDB path. This is something that would have been easy to strip, but the bad guy didn't do it. And we can see actually on his drive where he's storing the source code for this malware program that he's compiling. This stuff is amazing. You wouldn't believe how often you see this. I actually, I actually got the guy's name one time. I was doing a malware. He had it in documents and settings, slash surge, slash, you know, and he had the subdirectory. His name was in there. And we know that he has an E drive on the system. So if I wanted to search my enterprise for uh, Ghost, I could actually just do a search across all the drives or all the memory looking for GH0ST like that with a backslash. And I would probably find these dropped binaries because they contain the PDB path. So using something that's very unique to the developer's environment, I can actually start searching for anything else he may have compiled, not just this, assuming, of course, that he was using the same directory. Now, I dropped this onto Maltigo and did a link analysis and a transform, and Maltigo's really good for this. It actually combed the net, and it found several Chinese hacking sites that make reference to Ghost. So from here, I can start doing some analysis of this open source to find out who's involved with Ghost. Now, the secondary thing that was dropped out, turns out, has yet another MZ header buried inside of it. So it's like a little shell game. 
This third one drops out. It's not decrypted either. I mean, sorry, it's not obfuscated, so it's very easy to see. And it has E colon backslash ghost as well. But you'll notice it's a lowercase e in this case. And it goes out and, it's, and it actually is a, uh, something called res SSDT. Well, of course, I see SSDT. I'm thinking system service descriptor table right off the bat. That's clearly visible just in the strings. And what's really interesting about this example is that if we had done ghost backslash as our search, we would have caught that, that sys file assuming it wasn't being hidden by a rootkit or that we were using a forensically sound uh, access to the drive so that you know, rootkit level hiding wouldn't have been working in that case. That means that these kinds of approaches have some amount of predictive capability. They will tend to find things that you don't know about yet, and that's really, really good. All right, so let's see what we know about this thing. So we see this i386 sys. Whenever you see that, you're dealing with a kernel mode driver. So that's kind of a rule you can go with. So I happen to know that also I see SSDT. So I think, okay, it's kernel mode driver of some kind, and it's probably messing around with the SSDT, which is a pretty common way that rootkits are written. Now, if I drop the strings out of that thing further down, I also see some other things that let me know that it is a kernel mode driver. This is the IO functions, IOF complete request, which actually closes out an ERP packet as it's going in and out of the kernel. I see another one, KE service descriptor table, which is the exported name for the SSDT that the driver's view of it would be using KE service descriptor table to get that base. And then I see probe for read and probe for write. That tells me also those are just functions that would only be used in the kernel. But furthermore, there are also functions that would only be used if the kernel mode code was manipulating other memory, probably in user space. And so those are us just giving me some more information. I didn't have to go look at any disassembly to figure out some of these capabilities from the dropped malware. Now, I also see IOF complete request, IO create device, IO create symbolic link. These functions mean that there is both a user mode and a kernel mode component. In order to do that, drivers have to put a named, uh, they have to put a named device path that you can access over the file system. And you can see that in Unicode here at the bottom of the file. So I see res SSDT in two different forms. So again, that would be a great scan to run across the enterprise. Find any window object that has the name res SSDT and I might find all the other variants of this particular rootkit that are currently in my enterprise. Link analysis again, res SSDT with Multigo, transform. Multigo is really great because it actually, it actually you know, kind of crawls into places and it crawled deep within Kaspersky's site on this weird text file that wasn't even linked anywhere that I could see. You can't get to it. And way down at the bottom, rootkit.win32.res.sstt.br. Coincidence? Probably not. Somebody somewhere reported this particular malware to Kaspersky. So again, now I've got solid evidence that we've got ourselves a rootkit infection. We need to promote this to an incident response situation or a compromise. Now I went to my TMC, uh, TMC by the way, we at HP Gary have this thing we call TMC, it's Threat Monitoring Center. But anyways, the point is we have this giant farm of VMware machines that processes about 1.5 gigabytes of malware every day. And what it does is it runs the malware in the VM and then sticks everything in memory, drops the FizzMem, and does a complete sweep and pulls all the stuff out. And we store all the strings that we find in a big SQL database so we can go back and do searches. So I did ghost, searched for ghost in there, and I found all these different variants. So at the top, E colon backslash, our old friend is back. But at the bottom, we have a C colon backslash version, different guy. And if I look there, I can also see there's two different names for the driver, hack E and then Chen QI. But you can see the paths are the same. And in fact, it's even versioned, Ghost 3.6. So obviously, this thing's been worked on for a while. Now, up here, I see dot, question mark, AVC. That means that thing has a user interface. Those samples probably are the other side of Ghost, the actual remote control application itself. And when you see C Ghost View, C Ghost Doc, I don't know how many here have programmed in, in an MFC before, but they use something called the Document View Architecture. And having some coding background, I, I picked up on that right away. So somebody wrote an MFC-based UI to drive this thing, and that was sitting in, sitting in our archive. I could pull it out. So I'm going to just fast forward ahead. Um, I went ahead and found the people that wrote Ghost. Uh, they have this forum here, C Rufus Security Team. I translated their uh, Chinese names into uh, English here, so it's kind of weird looking. But these are the guys that write it, maintain it, and are probably very closely connected to many of the people who use it, and they use it themselves. So you can go ahead and check this thing out. So you can just go on the net right now and see it. So we have got this particular group, and I'm switching gears to a case study now. We have a group of guys that have been attacking uh, DOD systems for oh, about over five years now, and we've Back in 2005, we were responding to a US Army related incident, and we had this servicehost.dll.log was one of the strings that was inside of this malware. 
Um, in 2007, we had several others with that and an additional string, bind command first, but he misspelled first as frist. Then uh, late last year, another one was servicehost.dll.log. And then finally, just in March of this year, we had another one, didn't have the service host string, but did have bind command frist. So you start to see these connections over time. So what's going on here is there's a single attack uh, actor, it could be a group or an individual, who's been working this space for quite a while, and they, can, they keep reusing a lot of the same stuff. Now, in particular, this stuff here that I'm showing you, uh, you can get some code off the net that is in open source form. So it's possible that these guys might have been uh, copying that out as well. Okay, so let's look at timestamps. Let's move to the timestamp uh, time of compilation. PE header has two places. They're both 32-bit UTT timestamps, and they'll tell you the time in which the module was compiled. It doesn't, it's not the same thing as last access time or creation time in terms of what NTFS is telling you. It's actually the time in which the thing was compiled. And I've actually seen multiple malwares on a target system, both compiled within four hours of each other. Um, it's really interesting to watch that. We actually had two separate malware programs that at first glance didn't look like they were related. I mean, they were related in terms of it was the same incident, but the two malware looked different, but they had compile times within a few minutes of each other. That's not a coincidence. They're obviously the same guy. So you can actually get this module timestamp out of here, and we re we're going to release source code for a tool at the end of this uh, talk, actually, and you can go to HP Gary's booth. We've burned 100 CDs with the source code to the fingerprinting utility that I'm going to show off, but it has this timestamp parser in there, and it's all in open source as well, so you can build your own tools off this base. There's a second timestamp called the debug timestamp. It may not be there, but if it is, it's really interesting because not only does it give you the timestamp of when it was compiled, it also tells you the number of times the file has been compiled. So you can see that he's built it 18 times or 27 times. And so here's how you can get a glance, tell what kind of time you're dealing with. Typically, if you're dealing with a UTC 32-bit, it'll start with a 3 because that'll cover all the time from 95 until 2012. If you're dealing with a file time structure, which is measured in a different way, you will tend to see 01C at the beginning, or 01, and then a letter of some kind. And that'll cover the range from 1972 to 2057. So there's just some cheats for you. And there's the API calls at the bottom of the slide that you can use to convert that to human readable time. So this is just a measuring of all the compile times that I pulled from that exact same uh, Chinese APT case study. Um, and you can see over time how you get multiple hits all in a row as he's recompiling different versions. And again, these are, very, these are the same group working over the course of five years. Um, they, they're only, we codenamed it soy sauce. That's just our own internal word for this. But these guys have been busy for uh, basically focusing primarily on the Department of Defense and uh, Defense Industrial Base and the uh, associated contractors. So using compile time, if we could search our entire enterprise for every file's compile time and put it within the range that we know we found some already, and we extend that range a little bit, we're going to find a whole bunch of other stuff we didn't know about yet. Any other tools that that guy happened to have compiled uh, within that same week? And it might have been a completely different malware. Uh, maybe it's past the hash toolkit, maybe it's something else. But if that compile time is set, you're going to get that indicator out, and you're going to be able to dig through those binaries. Now, this is an out this is interesting MAC address. Uh, don't get excited. It turns out that you're not going to be able to do this now as easy as you used to be able to. But um, everybody remembers Melissa virus. Here's how they actually got it. GUIDs are actually generated on a system in, two, in multiple versions. And a V1 GUID, you'll notice, well, has a 1 in that position that I've indicated on the slide. Those digits at the end are the MAC address of the machine that generated it. And that's how they caught the guy that, uh, that released the Melissa virus. But version 4 is where we're at now, and you would see a 4 in that position, and the, that is actually a random number at the end, so you couldn't use that technique. But I just put this up there to just show you the possibilities with what can be represented in binary alone. Now, I spent quite a lot of time doing compiler timestamp or compiler version checking and runtime library version checking, and that'll be in the fingerprint tool that you see. Um, there's all kinds of information you can get there. So you know that it was all compiled off the same version of Dev Studio or the same version of Borland Delphi. Um, you can also check to see, is he using static or dynamic linking of the C runtime libraries? Is he using a single-threaded or multi-threaded model? These things would be settings that would be in the actual dev studio and likely not to change unless he's you know, changing the way his projects work. Does he use standard template library? I've got a couple of guys that we're tracking who really like STL. We've got other ones that don't use it. And whether or not they use new or old versions of stream libraries. And for that reference, just check the uh, MSDN link that I put at the bottom there. 
So here's a little cheat chart. We'll, chart. we'll show you the different uh, versions of Visual Studio related by which Visual C runtime they're using. And 